it's possible that you can have your own seat on a table where people might potentially not see you yet there. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> Ellie. Ellen. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the pandemic. I mean, it's so, I mean, it's 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 so imminent for every one of us. And I think that if if the pandemic has taught us one thing, then it's it's you can't imagine the unimaginable, right? So it's like who would have said something like this? Um, a half year ago, we all would have thought the pandemic is over. Now it's even worse. So it's like you can't plan that much. Okay, I was talking about the strategies, and I'm more strategic nowadays. But still, you have to be open <clears throat> to adapt your target-specific behavior, right? So sometimes you have a moving target. You grow older, you have other, you know, affordances, you have other responsibilities. So your target um, may change. They may, um, there are new changes or new new targets or the, the targets have, you know, moved to the distance. But however, you can adapt your behavior. And then also to the values, know your values, and then you always have a compass. Where you want to go or where you shouldn't go. I am very appreciative to have Professor Dr. Eleonore Sui Winkles and Dr. Irene Kilubi as my fifth guest as part of the It's Possible series. Dr. Irene Kilubi is a management consultant with powerful companies such as BMW, Deloitte, Siemens and others. She is a sought after conference speaker and a university lecturer in digital marketing and entrepreneurship. Following a very personal passion, she is pursuing now work through community building, corporate influencer strategy and joint generations. Professor Dr. Eleonore Sui Winkles teaches industrial and occupational psychology at FOM in Germany. She has won several lecturing awards. She is the founder and CEO of postdoctransformation.com, helping PhD students to decide whether to become a sustainably visible professor or to transition their career into business with her self-paced e-courses. In my conversation, I will talk with Irene and Ellie about intergenerational topics, including age diversity and mentoring. We will also explore non-linear careers and transferable skills from different aspects of one's career. Hello, welcome to the show, Ellie and Irene. Hi. <laughs> nice Hello. to meet you. Hello. It is so nice to see you all the way from Germany and I'm here in Canada. And now for people who might not know you both yet, could you introduce yourself, please? And what I do here is to have people introduce themselves according to the working out loud methods with five facts. And um, Ellie, why don't you go ahead, please? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here. And my five facts um, are, I'm a mom of two. So I have um, two little children, uh, age four and seven. I'm a professor of industrial and occupational psychology in Germany. Um, I'm the founder of Postdoc Transformation, that is um, providing career services for people who are early career scientists who either want to leave science or who want to become professors. And um, one fun fact, I do not share that openly or mostly, as like um, I've been a high, high school senior in the US, uh, in Norfolk, oh, Ohio. That's why I'm, I'm actually a fan of North America. So I was um, also for my honeymoon in Canada. So that's my fifth fact. I was there at the Horseshoe Falls, Niagara Falls. Yeah, and then went over to uh, Toronto and um, yeah. So I actually do love North America, especially the food in Toronto, Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. And you're ready? Yes, hello everyone. 
Well, a fact about me, I'm the founder of Joint Generations. We build bridges between different generations. Um, I'm pretty convinced that in my next life, I'll be a stand-up comedian. Yes. <laughs> I have a strongly developed photographic memory. Um, I am a little bit afraid of hate. Uh, what else? Um, I love to work with startups, pioneers, visionaries, and change makers. And my um, fun fact is I have moved 23 times. Did I already say that? No. Mm -hmm. no. Wow. That's my fun fact. I already moved 23 times. And what uh, connects me with Canada, in fact, is that my father is Canadian and I have three siblings that are also Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. It is so nice to welcome you both onto the show. And I would also like to say hello to everybody who might be watching us right now or watching the replay later or might be listening to us later when I publish this um, conversation on the Job Sharing and Beyond episode um, the podcast as an episode. And now our conversation today is part of the Canada Career Month's It's Possible series. And because of this, I would like to start off with asking both of you, when you were originally starting your career, what did you anticipate your career to be and what actually happened so far? And Irene, could we start with you, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, to be honest, I wanted to be everything. I was never <laughs> sure what I will be in my future. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a teacher. I think anything possible, right? So um, since our life is very short and we don't have the opportunity to test out many different stuff. So um, I took a break after my A-levels and um, then I went to um, a school after that where I learned a bit of about economics and I thought, oh, okay, it might be potentially interesting. However, I thought that I would uh, start in the food industry or in the fast moving consumer goods. But at the end of the day, I started in a very technical environment, which was in the automotive industry. And it, I moved for, forward to work also in the mechanical engineering industry. So it's totally turned out to be different from what I expected. That is so interesting. And what about you, Ellie? Well, when I was like 12 or so, I actually had my epiphany moment that I wanted to become a professor. And in hindsight, I've become, I've became one, but it was more a nonlinear thing. And I always say it's, I was lucky to become a professor because I did my PhD in neuroscience or after my psychology studies, I did my PhD in neuroscience. And then um, during the financial crisis, I had to leave. And uh, I was really happy to leap into the IT industry because that was then a great economy. And I, I truly enjoyed it there. And um, when I became pregnant, or when I was pregnant, I then moved back to academia. And I was lucky. And so now, based on what it sounds like, you know, you might have both thought, well, in, in Ellie's case, you had thought about maybe being a professor, but like, given that you had seen or have seen different industries, what would you, you know, what advice or what, um, you know, tips or suggestions would you give young professionals starting out and, you know, they might know where to go to initially or may not. What well, what would you tell them? Can I go first? Yes, please. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I mean, to me, I always talk to my to my own students, bachelor and master's students, but also MBA students and early career scientists. I always tell them, you know, I don't do the same mistake like I did. I was so convinced that I want to become a professor for neuropsychology that I just did whatever was needed for that path and um, nowadays I'm thinking like why didn't I do economics as well why didn't I do why didn't I take classes in marketing or sales or whatever so it's like it, it's I had a very you know narrow path and then when I had to leap out the only thing that I could use was my English 
<laughs> and a little bit, I mean, that was also just a coincidence, a little bit of coding abilities, but I would have never said that I would go into the IT industry. I, I went there because it was a coincidence. And um, that, that's about what I'm saying. It was luck. So it wasn't a strategic move. And what I would tell my students is always think about the open, I mean, think about being open enough to see where it's, where it's good. I mean, I'm lucky. The IT industry is a good economy, but it could have been worse as well. So I didn't think about it that much. And that is something when I see the future of work today, I always tell my students which are the industries that are booming, which will be the ones that will probably, you know, still have jobs in 10 years time so that when you start there, you can, you know, climb up the ladder and make a name for yourself and, and do not have to switch again. That's, that's so helpful. Thank you. And I mean, what, what would be your feedback or suggestions? Mm -hmm. I truly believe that uh, most people are unhappy with their profession because they either pursue something where they're really good at, where they feel very successful, or they only pursue a profession where they have passion about, right? But still, there's a lack of success stories. So I truly believe you have to find something where both comes together, passion and your strength. You, you got to have fun in what you're doing, be passionate about it, but still you got to have some sort of success stories to share, right? So that would be my advice. And also to never stand still. If you feel like you need to try out something else or you have changed because you're not the same person being 25 or 30, do it because security is just an illusion. And if there are people out there telling you, oh, now you're wasting everything you've learned, experienced the last five or 10 years. I say, no, that's, that's not true because you can always gain transferable knowledge and skills that you can use for another activity. I think that is such an important aspect. And that's actually, you know, a perfect segue to a question I wanted to ask about both of you have had non-linear, so to speak, career passes. And so, um, like, what would you say, maybe could you talk about some of these skills you have learned in some of these, um, you know, previous positions that you felt have suited you really well in where you are today. Yeah. Um, yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, I must say that when I became a PhD in neuroscience, that was quite straightforward. I mean, I was just focusing even more on the brain. I was interested in any way. But when I went into the IT industry, I um, the first jobs were like IT analysts, IT consultants, something like that. It was always something about how can you negotiate the, the contracts? How can you try to find the right requirements? How can you understand the affordances of the people and something like that? So um, it wasn't the tech that I was lacking because I wouldn't be in the situation where I would use the tech as such as someone from the tech industry. But it was more like, how can you sort of um, understand the people who are using whatever they are using and how they could improve the process in using that. And that is something that I learned as a psychologist. So in a, in a way, it was the perfect um, foundation, but the, the, the job ad didn't say we need a psychologist. So when I read the job ad, it was like, oh, they need someone who can speak English. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Yeah. So just for the just for the sake of it, I needed I needed the money. I, I was like, okay. So my my scholarship ran out for for a couple of four months or so. I needed the money. So I was like, I'll try that, and we'll see where it gets me. And it was just a fun ride to me actually, because I always got to. I mean, I have the 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 difficult client. I got the difficult clients, but you know, when it's lost, you can gain so much more. That is awesome. Thank you. And Irene, what what about you? What would you tell somebody who is a young professional? 
what have been some of your transferable skills from all the different areas? Mm -hmm. um, I would say probably like uh, to learn about the mechanism, how people behave at work and how they communicate, how they interact with one another. And I was always very interested to, to see like um, how others are doing, right? But I often forgot myself. So what I really learned or, or was very impressive for me when I did my um, coaching education, right? So when I started, um, the lecturer told us like, okay, we have to practice on ourselves. And I said like, uh, no, I just want to learn the methods. I just want to know how, <laughs> how it works, how to coach people. And he said, no, you have to practice it on your own experience. And I said like, oh, I, actually, I didn't want to do it to therapy, you know? But at the end of the day, I will never forget when we started, uh, they said, he said, we're going to start with our values. And I said, oh, my gosh, why start with values? I just want to learn the methods, you know? And then I realized for myself how important it is. We forget it so much at a uh, workplace to think about the hard, uh, the soft skills as well, because we're so focused to be technically good, to have um, the hard skills and knowledge, but really to focus also on yourself, what you truly want and not what the environment is wanting from you, right? So this is what I really learned that um, you should also think about your personal development along the way. Mm -hmm. That Absolutely is, right. this is so <laughs> important. And, you know, and often when we look at soft skills, we, I feel, do not see how many areas around um, you know, one's life, one can develop soft skills from that, you know, from caregiving, from volunteering. There are so many areas and I often feel they are still undervalued as a way to improve or learn new um, soft skills. Absolutely. I mean, um, to your point, I, I know that you are so into that point and I can, I can, I can really say I have students who know me um, before I got pregnant and after because I was already a good lecturing at the FOM University and um, it, they they said to be honest you are better now than before having the kids mm -hmm. and that was because not because I was nicer or I mean most of my students tell me that I'm the end game. So it's not the nice, I mean, it's not, it's not that I, they all feel comfy with me, but it's like, um, I, I have developed a more um, long sighted view, what is good for them and not what is good for them at the moment. So it's like, I've, I've grown into a person who has got, who has become very strategic and prioritizing the steps in a way that um, they can understand and they can grow into. And that is something that I do with my children all the day, I mean, all day. I can't expect them to follow me all the way, but I have to meet them where they are. And that is something that I have learned as a mom. And um, I mean, you have no choice as a mom, right? So it's like, <laughs> you have to deal Once with whatever mom. comes. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a big spectrum, what mm. can happen. And I think it's, to be honest, what I completely had underestimated is the the, the control is no longer with one. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately driven by, you know, the child, or it could be, you know, if one looks after elderly relatives or any situation where one cannot 100%, you know, anticipate or, you know, things can just unexpectedly happen. And I think to your point, to then also um, set little, you know, like practical ways to help children or transferable, like, you know, junior professionals help them to grow by giving them some task or giving them some challenges to, you know, maybe do something they didn't initially believe they could do and then see how they can grow. So 
And now, as we are talking about this, I would like to kind of, you know, slide into the next topic because it fits really well, talking about, you know, intergener intergenerational learning, joint generation, because I feel it is often an aspect of diversity that isn't really looked at when we look at or people <clears throat> don't automatically think about it. And so I would like to ask you both, why do you feel it is so important to have a joint, uh, you know, um, working together between so many different generations? And I will start with you, Irene. Yes, of course, we can't ne neglect the demographic change. But however, more important is the fact that we believe that um, generations working together can be more creative, can increase competitiveness and also innovativeness of companies, but also for our society, um, they can share their knowledge, they can communicate, they can make um, the world a better place, right? And there was even a study from Deloitte from last year, I guess it was, they found out that 70% of all organizations truly believe that um, intergenerational workforce is very important to their success. However, still only 10% of them feel prepared for that, right? So as we can experience nowadays, um, the population is growing, it's um, getting older and older, and it's difficult for them to stay abreast of the future and to attract new talents, right? Because they have different expectations on the on the way of working in the future. Because um, our parents in the past, you know, they were very loyal to their employers. They needed security. They wanted to have a career. But nowadays, the youngers want to have a work-life balance, a true work-life balance, and not a work-work-life balance, right? And they also want to have the feeling to be appreciated they want to um, follow their purpose, you know? They only want to pursue a profession where they truly feel that they can make a difference. So I feel bringing both perspectives together can be so valuable, right? And when we think about um, digital skills, I'm always talking about context. Of course, the younger have more, most of the time, more, um, yeah, more experience dealing with that because they grew up with it naturally, but still they lack the experience that the elder generation have and bringing them together, magic can happen. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it's, just, it's just awesome because I, you know, I feel so strongly about this and it's often so undervalued still and people just don't think about this and so yeah now one aspect of the intergeneral uh, intergenerational mentoring is to me also job sharing because then what you just described you're in in one position it can work just so well that people can teach each other mentor each other and maybe ellie if you could share what you have done in the past with some of your students as far as job sharing that I thought was such a innovative idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, be, I'll be happy to share that. Um, Laura Bellwinkel is one of my best students, uh, master students, and uh, she actually was pregnant like me when I was pregnant with the second child. And uh, she was such a good student that she was able to still ace all the tests and I saw her um, talking to other students and explaining things to her and I was like oh, she's really a talent lecturing talent so um, one day I have um, I, I was offered a course which was too much for my you know I, I had my limits and I said I don't I can't take this anymore I, I mean I'm, I'm working part-time okay so I'm a professor in part-time that is for a reason I don't want to work full-time anymore at the moment with my, with my kids and met with my business so I said well if you don't find anyone else what we can do is we job share so we are uh, we are a lecturing duo out of the 16 uh, lecturing appointments uh, I will do the first the middle one and the last one with her see her um doing that stuff 
um, from from the distance. If she needs me, I can be in the class, but I want her to grow into the role that she is the go-to person. And I just, just overshadow, sort of like shadow her, so to speak. So it's the other way around. And it, that was such a great thing. I mean, it's absolutely um, amazing for, for this one woman to do this. And I'm, I haven't been able to sort of um, duplicate that again, but it's, it's something that is worth looking at in the sense that um, I didn't have the time. I could let her grow into that role. And she was able to, to, you know, to find her space. And that was, um, if I, if I have another student like that, I would go for that. Yeah. That, and it's, it's to me, for me, it's like when I'm I'm growing older and for me, career is something different now as for younger people. And I say, I can make room. You know, it's like I don't need this visibility anymore. I can make room so that others can grow. Yeah, I just think that's so important now for people who are listening to us, who are young professionals and who may not have that opportunity that you just described, Ellie. How could they or how should they be looking potentially for a mentor maybe of a different generation so they could maybe do even some reverse mentoring among each other? What would you recommend to somebody? Shall I say something? Yeah, go, go, please. Okay. I have that actually. I, I have a student, um, again, a master student, and she knows me really well because she she has followed me on social media. And um, then she, I, I openly say, you know, this is my sandbox. I'm not a digital native in social media. I try openly things, but they fail. And I don't feel that I fail, but the things fail. If you have an idea how I can improve that, just let me know. The only person who said something was her. And she then said, well, you know, you could do this or you could do that. And um, I let her come with the suggestions and I asked her, so what shall I really do with that? And, and she, she, you know, she lived up to the promise, so to speak. Right. So she, she delivered and I was like, okay, that is really valuable. Now it's already like this, that for a year or so, um, I'm sending her a video, which she then sort of like says, okay, you can go ahead or you now you should do this. So I don't do this with every video, but every time that I do something completely new, I ask her because I can trust her that she has, she is my eyes and my ears in the younger generation. I don't have it. I mean, my, my humor is totally different. Uh, sometimes I do a joke or make a joke and they laugh and sometimes they don't, but I lack this, this, right. you know, and, and it's, it's, I think that, um, everyone can benefit from the other generations the same i do with my mentors they are typically older mm -hmm. and um, i ask them the same way that my young uh, student does with me um, and i think that um, you have to find someone and it doesn't have to be an official mentoring position but you have to find someone who is a good people developer who is open to share the knowledge and to share the experience and you it's 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 an exchange so you can't just expect but you have to also give and if that is a mutual agreement then that's the best learning curve that you can ever have you can have it alone but it's uh, it's faster and more, more fun together i i mean that's that's really awesome yes thank you for that advice and Irin, what have you seen? What do you recommend to somebody who might be younger? How could they be looking for mentors? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that Ellie already correctly pointed it out and perfectly fine. But I would like to touch on how you can reach out to someone or find the correct one. So yes. there are many different programs out there that I can also recommend, right? I don't know um, the ones in Canada, but I know the German speaker, like Fee Mentor from Anastasia Barna. Mm -hmm. Or you have Mentor Me, um, I forgot, uh, Katharina Heinzel, <laughs> it's her name. And also, we are also launching pretty soon a reverse uh, mentoring program where people can, can join. So look out for programs out there. Then do your networking, attend events, attend... Uh, LinkedIn Live Talks like we do right now, you know? So, and 
of course and don't be afraid you know like um i have also two um, mentees that approached me that i didn't know beforehand but um they said i attended one of your webinars and i found it very inspiring i think i can learn a lot from you and um yes and when I got the first connection. We met on Zoom or online whatsoever. And I noticed that there's a match, right? Because it's also important when you you, you want to find the right mentor that um, you somehow get along with each other. You like each other, that you really appreciate the other person. But if you feel uncomfortable, because it's all about trust, trusting each other, showing appreciation and not having this typical mentor and mentee role, but to... Um, be on the same eye level, eye right? level yeah absolutely yes, it's True. definitely to, because it's a win-win situation yeah, because absolutely. i also select uh, my um mentees based on the fact that i feel that they really truly want to improve themselves better themselves you know because it makes me also happy if i feel that my mentees are successful and on the other hand side of course also um when i feel that i can also potentially learn from them because i say like I love to learn. I love to grow. So why not also have someone um, maybe younger or older that I can learn from? Yeah, that that is so wonderful. And I I mean I feel like having that conversation with both of you has already <laughs> given somebody who might be a young profession or anybody truly so many great ideas. And um, as we are coming towards the end of our conversation because it is the it's possible series i want to make sure to you know if you could share your it's possible statement so that somebody listening to us you know has another inspiring idea so whoever would like to start go ahead can i start okay yes, please yes please. it's possible <laughs> okay <laughs> it's possible that you can have your own seat on a table where people might potentially not see you yet there. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> Ellie? Ellen. Yeah, I, I was thinking about the pandemic. I mean, it's so, I mean, it's 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 so imminent for every one of us. And I think that if if the pandemic has taught us one thing, then it's it's you can't imagine the unimaginable, right? So it's like who would have said something like this? Um, a half year ago, we all would have thought the pandemic is over. Now it's even worse. So it's like, you can't plan that much. Okay, I was talking about the strategies and I'm more strategic nowadays, but still you have to be open <clears throat> to adapt your target specific behavior, right? So sometimes you have a moving target. You grow older, you have other, you know, affordances, you have other responsibilities. So your target um, may change. They may, um, there are new changes or new, new targets or the, the targets have, you know, moved to the distance. But however, you can adapt your behavior. And then also to the values, know your values. And then you always have a compass where you want to go or where you shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love that. Thank you so much. And now, like, you know, I can talk with both of you forever, but is there anything that you would like to add that you feel we haven't covered yet in our conversation that would be something you want to share with um, our young professionals? I'm... Okay, start, go on. <laughs> I have something on my mind, and that is most of my students, even if they are really good, they do not speak up, okay? And I think that they have to yet find their voice. And the voice is not someone else's voice. They don't have to echo, but they have to find their own voice. And if they don't voice it out, no one will listen. No one will even hear what they want to say, could say. So um, as to the, as to this, I mean, to this picture of taking the seed that no one is actually attributing you to, to take, it's if you don't know where you want to go, then you probably won't get that seed. That's great. Yeah. Yes. Um, my advice would be to young professionals um, that once you 
have completed your studies whatsoever, apprenticeship, and enter an organization, try to actively listen. Ask as many questions as you can possibly do. Not try to think that you, you know everything because what you've learned beforehand at school, at university, those are just frameworks and theories. You have to deal with the reality, you know, and you have to overcome challenges and not give up so early on because you say like, okay, it doesn't fit to what I've, I've learned or what I know, because that's in fact shows um, your motivation, your, uh, your right. you're driven, definitely, right? So um, try to find your own way of coping with situations and learn from others who have been there before because they have more experience than you have right now. That is wonderful, yes. And now, how can people find you? Can you share, you know, some of your social media, um, you know, um, platforms where you are on? Ellie, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn, um, but Irene is really the community key, uh, queen, right? So I was saying, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. And uh, but uh, my my newest sandbox uh, that where I really have fun is in Instagram and also mm -hmm. in TikTok. So it's like um, yeah, it's my it's it's where I discover much of the things that I have missed during my PhD times. Like it, it's reconnecting with people from my community that I have um, long forgotten, so to speak. And it's like. Uh, it's homecoming. It's, it's really fun. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And I will be sure, especially when, you know, this um, conversation becomes a podcast episode, I will put all of the links into the show notes so people can, um, you know, find you. And Irin, what about you? Yes, in fact, I really admire Ellie for being so active on different platforms. And she's, for me, she's the rock star, right? <laughs> she always says that she learned from me, but now, yes, she, no, now you're far better than I am. So that's in fact the way it's supposed to be, right? Like with Aristotle and Socrates, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I'm a teacher. laughs> so, um, most of the time I'm active on LinkedIn. Some might even say that it's my second home. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, but That's whatever she does is like huge. <laughs> yes. He goes viral. So you can find your LinkedIn with my full name. Okay. <laughs> no nickname. <laughs> well, thank you. So I will be sure to put this in the show notes and uh, that people follow both of you. And also when somebody is going to watch us in the replay, we will put... Um, your connections and links into the comments so they can immediately follow you. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was such a wonderful conversation. And, you know, it's truthfully, if I, you know, like 20 or 30 years ago, if I had listened to people like you that would have made such a difference so thank you for you know paying it forward to the um you know younger okay. generation so thank you very much thank you thank you for having this conversations i think that it's 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 a great way to globally be together mm -hmm. stronger together in those times where you think that hope is really hard to grasp so mm -hmm. Thank you for this doing for doing this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the show. We hope you gained valuable insights and new ideas. To keep listening to future episodes, please head over to iTunes or your favorite player and subscribe and give it a rating. We would very much appreciate a review and for you to share it on social media so more people can start innovating in how they offer employment. Until the next time, goodbye.